Okay, the next hour we want to tell you something about what happened in the last one and a half to two years. Namely, if you look at the reports, it seems like the entire cryptography is broken. We don't want to talk to you about mathematics. Um, I was told not to. But we want to talk to you about the cryptocalypse and the societal implications of what we can do about it. So we're going to start with a short look back, a review what the biggest security problems of the last one and a half years were, not just on a cryptographic, but also on a political level. And then we want to see what are the main reasons, what are the categories that we can sort these issues, and what can we do against these era categories. Is there anything that we can do? Can we make cryptography trustworthy again? Is there something we can do to make it more secure? And can we do anything to prevent the next one and a half years from um, looking the same? We want to start by looking at how many security issues there were. And um, one estimate are the common vulnerabilities and exposures to CVEs. It's a system to describe security holes and categorize them. And if you look at them, we can see that security holes have risen over the years. But we also have to add that we can't just look at it absolutely. There's always a, a certain bias in this data. Namely, it's always good if more security holes are detected. Just because they're not being found doesn't mean they're not there. Sometimes we have problems to categorize them, what category they fall into. And that's just the problem with these statistics, that sometimes several security issues appear twice or, or thrice in these uh, statistics because they fall in different categories. And sometimes you have a security issue that consists of so many different uh, issues that it only appears as one collective issue in the statistics. There's also a disbalance because software that is um, in wide use gets more eyes on it. So there's a, a quote from the CVE mailing list where, well, obviously, um, disclosures about software vendors like Microsoft are given higher priority than PHP golf applications written by some undergraduate because that factually does not apply to anyone. We want to start by describing the problems that happened in the last one and a half years, and we start start with the most ridiculous, the ones you really don't have to have. So several times we realized that there's software that pretends to encrypt stuff, but doesn't. Um, I think the last one was NQ Vault. There was an article where they offered to encrypt your data on your smartphone, but in reality, what they did was uh, encrypt the first 128 bytes and encrypt this in big quotes here because in the end it was just X over the constant key. And that is just really not uh, encryption at all. We also have this typical error where you think, why does this have to happen? If you think that uh, to, uh, with the TV Mond hack, the operation of security was non-existent because they just put uh, passwords on post-it notes on the screens. So that's really something you don't have to have. But there are also proper um, CVEs, proper exploits like Shellshock. Shellshock led to, if you used the bash shell anywhere in your stack, and you could introduce variables from the outside that uh, especially formatted variables would be executed with elevated rights than when they were set, which made it possible to execute any arbitrary command you wanted. A large group of catastrophes that happened was the entire SSL and TLS disaster, which is the encrypted end-to-end -end communication from client to server. And there were a bunch of those. First was go to fail, a classic. And just by, by looking at the code, even if, you, if you're not a coder or you don't really understand what everything means, you can see that having go to fail, go to fail is probably not what you want because it leads to 
when checking the certificate of a server and this reached a specific state that I don't just hit the first go to fail if there's an error, but I always hit the go to fail even if there's no error. And thus the verification um, never the, the ne verification never succeeds. Which means anyone can use this and fake his identity. We had Heartbleed, it was relatively early. And uh, Heartbleed was based on a uh, Heartbleed extension for OpenSSL and TLS that regularly pinged to server say, hey, are you still there? And usually the way it works was that, or the way it was supposed to work was that somebody, like uh, the, the client sends a, uh, a token with like four letters and the server responds to the same token. But it turned out that you could just say, hey, here's a word of 500 characters, but then you only send four and then the server just filled that with the next uh, 490 something um, bytes in memory, which led to information disclosure. For example, the master keys of the service, the private keys, um, user passwords, cookies, and pretty much everything as you can imagine. Then we had Poodle. Poodle relied on uh, attackers being able to force browsers to fall back to insecure HTTP connections. Um, many, we don't actually want to use SSL 3.0 anymore, but for backwards compatibility, many servers still support that. So the man in the middle could just say, oh no, actually I don't speak TSL 1.2, no 1.1, no 1.0. Uh, actually I want to speak SSL 3, which then led to attackers being able to fake the identity and sniff the traffic. And lastly, of the same group, there's the Freak Attack. Freak Attack also exploited uh, downgrade attacks that you could negotiate down to an insecure version of RSA um, from the times of the crypto wars when the US had export limitations on secure encryption mechanisms, which is still implemented today in many libraries. So, uh, fails happen a lot and many are just very embarrassing for the programmers. Uh, um, the so with Apple it's really obvious that something fails um, but Apple didn't put in the same security practices as Microsoft and so in the last two years we had a situation where um, there's been more attacks on Apple and OS X and iPhone than um, on Microsoft and all the years before. I had a talk at the Communication Congress last year, and here I can I can fill a quarter of this talk just with mention some Heiser News ticker. Um, why is it called Heiser Security ticker? It is like one of the home tickets for sysadmins, especially Windows admins. These are people that are not necessarily um, negatively disinclined towards Windows, so I found it interesting. Here, for example, is uh, in reaction to the freak attack, Microsoft patched the problem very quickly, and um, beside the official patching strategy, they sent, even sent out a hotfix before. The problem was that this hotfix uh, has damaged the system, and especially normal updates did not install anymore, which was, of course, um, kind of painful. Heiser Security uh, commented that in a rather cynical way, uh, saying things like, well, Microsoft users should be used to problems by now. But the, prob the, the problems didn't get any better. Why you could say that in the freak case, Microsoft at least tried to patch the issue quickly, we now get to the other extreme, exchanging the SHA-1 function that has uh, been broken for about 18 years has just recently been started. And here, too, uh, something bad happened when Microsoft botched that update 
and especially annoying was that that hotfix that patch uh, not only damaged the Windows into a reboot loop, but it also damaged uh, Linux systems that were installed in the same partition. So this uh, sounds funnier than it is. We have to think that there's lots of Windows systems, uh, embedded Windows systems, and when they get into a boot loop from an automatic update, um, that will be a huge problem in producing industry. So that's something that's seen as a big problem in this industry. In the actual case, it's especially annoying that Microsoft did not just destroy their own software, but uh, basically disabled the entire boot sector. So uh, a parallel installation of Linux doesn't boot either after updating Windows. So that is, of course, very dissatisfying. And we just found out that we have people that cause security issues. We have software that is created by people that cause security issues, but we also have another problem. We have broken standards. We have standards that are compromised by uh, secret services that have been deliberately weakened. So they, they destroy the entire concept of security. In September 2013, we heard about a uh, relatively um, relatively bad backdoor in a uh, random number generator by the National Institute for Standards Technology. It has been rumored to be backdoored for a while. So people have already suspecting foul play here because that standard has been introduced by NSA. That is not very uncommon, but it doesn't mean that it will be that backdoor, but it makes it more, li uh, more likely. So they've been scrutinizing the algorithm. Afterwards, we found out that it wasn't all just this one compromise standard, but also that RSA received $10 million from the NSA to, int to implement this um, new NIST curve into their, their crypto standards library and use it as a default, which means we have broken standards, bad actors, and broken software. But we also have broken hardware. In the last months and years, we have seen a trend that the attacks happen on um, ever deeper layers. So when we say we compromise things on a software layer, we have different ways of counteracting that or by just using different software. But if your hardware is compromised, you can't do much against, for example, having a BIOS that has a rootkit included. And um, like with Light Eater, it automatically takes data out, out of the system RAM whenever a specific process is started, which means you can create as many new private keys as you want. If the rootkit can just read the private key from memory immediately, then uh, we're not getting anywhere. What we've also seen is the Gemalto SIM card hack. That was um, when it was revealed that NSA and GCHQ stole SIM card keys from Gemalto manufacturer. That means that the encryption between the phone and the cell tower could be broken without any way to tell. It also enabled them to fake SIM cards and thus incriminate people. You could, it, it allowed you to clone a SIM card um, and to, to hide extra data that was sent, uh, for example, by a vector, they actually changed the provider's invoicing system. Another problem with hardware is our, politic uh, our politicians and our policies. There were reports of uh, Crypto Wars 3.0 where they had claims and uh, calls for uh, claim, sorry, calls against uh, encryption because then the police wouldn't have any way to um, find the evil, evil terrorists if they were able to encrypt their communications. And so various sites called for um, from by, by Obama, by uh, Cameron, by De Maizière, um called for key scroll, mandatory key scroll, as a reaction to the war of terror and a reaction to the Charlie Hebdo attacks, um, which is supposed to help them catch the uh, suspects. And they were drawing a parallel to, um, to a raid in the home, where they're saying, well, this analogy is, is uh, bullshit. You usually realize when the police comes knocking at your door and starts going through your stuff. And in the digital case, 
you don't see anything, you don't have any influence, so it's a completely different thing. So that's what I wanted to show you. Now we want to ask ourselves, is it broken or can it still be salvaged? And we tried to um, break down the error categories. The first, the first problem is the human. Uh, we've seen this with the Tewi's sender that was hacked um, because there was no way of thinking of security and the passwords were just hanging around. And many people who have sensitive data in their job uh, and work with it don't think about this enough. The second problem are systems that are uh, very insecure but are still used, um, like in Berlin, uh, in uh, uh, bureaucracy, uh, old Windows systems are used, although uh, a year ago the support of updates was stopped. Uh, the RKA in uh, Lower Saxonia had already uh, established Linux, but went back to Windows, which is less secure. Which was because the staff members couldn't use the USB ports, so they had extra Windows uh, PCs in their offices so they could use it there and then they s said yeah our workers won't use Linux anyway so we can back to Windows. Mm -hmm. if, if software, we know that if software has 10,000s of lines of code instead of thousands, we know that there, there will be uh, bugs in there. And we have to stop blaming bugs on, on people. Instead, we have to try and make sure to audit software, um, to get people who can audit software, and to get the means to audit software. So another problem is legacy software. Even when I myself code my own software and I have it audited, I usually use libraries. So I'm using layers beyond, uh, below the one that I'm using. So especially with open source software, you don't really, uh, especially if you don't have open source software, you have no idea what happens in these libraries. Another problem is simply bad software engineering. There are methods, there's extreme programming, there's the four eyes principle, which means that not only one person looks at the code. There are code reviews, but none of this is guarantees a bug-free software, but it is at least a necessary precondition to achieve it. Even more drastic is the situation in the topic of backdoors, and now I have to use some big um, computer science words. If you have closed source programs, so where nobody can look at the code, it is a um, it is a uh, simple task for cryptographers to look for ways uh, to to smuggle data out. And while with um, hacked biases, it would be possible to to read data from uh, the lowest levels. Um, nowadays, we have hardware that can even do uh, network connections without the operating system knowing. So, if you can look at the code, if you cannot look at the code, you are provably helpless. Free software makes it possible to look at the code, and we have seen, and we also have to say that nobody um, realized these open source bugs until it was very, very late in the case of Heartbleed and uh, go to fail, where it was found but after a painfully long time. 
So even in the open source movement, this should be an opportunity for reflection and self-criticism. But I have to say, open source makes backdoors a lot harder in any case. So it is a necessary precondition that we are able to look at the code. So the people who weigh open source against other things uh, say things like there's shared source or there's um, published source code with restrictive licensing. That is correct. Um, PGP or Cryptophone are commercial products, but with their source code published. So if you want to define it um, exactly, you have to say that readable source code is a necessary precondition, but not a sufficient condition, because obviously the entire community and the users of open source too haven't had the chance or haven't taken the chance to actually look at the code. But what I'd also like to say is that open source is a great achievement, and especially in the area of cryptography, it is something we should be happy about. I know this is a conference, lots of people stand on the stage and say, this is a revolution, it will change everything. We should be critical indeed, but I'd like to say that it's not it's not as bad as it seems. You don't need to hire mathematicians. All the science is public. It will be evaluated in the scientific community. Nobody has to pay for that. Open source is also usually um, freely available at no cost. So the tools to dramatically change the game are available, but they need to be used. Again, the Snowden revelations have shown that Firstly, the cryptography holds, even though there's people that do this for 10 or 20 years um, in the area of, sh of the hash functions, SHA-1, RC-4, we warned about, but all in all, cryptography is still solid. Open source doesn't, uh, open source also still works, um, because now we can see that looking back, Edward Snowden put his life into the hands of uh, GNUPG. And also, a audit has shown that uh, GNUPG is a tool that enables you to achieve a high level of security. The bad news is that still only very few people use it, and that is one of the main problems we're trying to address with this talk. The things are there, the software is on the market, you don't need to buy it, it's free, but please use it. The last point that I want to make is that the open source community has a problem with quality assurance. You just have to say that plainly. The heartbeat uh, shouldn't happy and go to fail should not have happened. And so far, in my eyes, it's um, there is a necessity for public and industrial users of open source to audit the software. So we can only call to the the uh, users who profit or who save millions by using open source and free software, I believe there, sh there is a um, legal, moral, ethical, and also commercial duty to um, fight for better audits of open source software. The second interesting thing is because we're in an area where community and ease of use are important. I would like to say that in this area, too, there's been some developments. Like, for example, HTTPS everywhere from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, foundation um, that you install once and it's not hard. Uh, web users have mostly installed ad blockers, like 70% of users. HTTPS everywhere is no more trouble, or even less in my opinion, to install the HTTPS um, extension, which does the following. When we enter a web address, that tool tries first to use a uh, SSL encrypted connection. This is completely transparent to the user, but it dramatically changes the game. Another point where it is rather funny that some of the comments that have so far been uh, only made by by geeks 
now has huge implications on states. Like, for example, perfect forward secrecy and having strong fuck of ES defaults. Um, PFS is a construct that means that every connection gets a new key. So leaving aside all the cryptography and mathematics, if every connection has a new key, that means that the attacker, that can be a state actor, that can be a, a, a judge's order or some hackers, they can only compromise one single connection. And the alternative and um, the alternative then is what was used against Lavabit, Edward Snowden's email provider. There is only one server key that was responsible for all um, server connections. So what happened was that the US government supported the uh, Lavabit um, proprietor to reveal the secret key, which of course then led to all customers being compromised. And that's an interesting question if you have a cloud service as a company and any one of the uh, people who are the same provider breaks the law, the, um, the government subpoenas the private key, then all my private data is also compromised, even though I'm not involved in any way. So here we have a point where even the BSI, the um, German Information Technology Certification Authority, demands minimum standards. And these include not using RC4 anymore, uh, but also uh, using perfect forward secrecy in any case. So that then an attacker cannot just grab one key for everything and uh, decrypt it afterwards, but they have to actually capture every single connection that they want to attack. I'm not a big fan of, uh, state, for, uh, of state interception, but even those can be um, even those can be applied in a legal fashion without implicating uh, other people's private data. There's also social protocols. For example, what I find interesting is that uh, the instant messaging is crypto there, crypto here, been discussed for 10 to 15 years. While Jabber and OTR have existed, a protocol that has been developed by cryptographers that has um, all the social properties of private communication. If you see it for the first time, people are usually confused, but this construction that I want to talk to someone on the web, I want to be sure that it's the intended recipient but there's also a right to privacy, which means that not every single utterance needs to be signed and uh, could be used against me. That is a social property of a protocol that has been addressed in the O2R protocol. And I think this here is a good place to point out that we cryptographers have been having interesting protocols for tens of years that allow anonymity and privacy but have been largely ignored by the um, rest of the internet community. So things like liquid feedback could be done properly with proper cryptography, but uh, obviously the young ones had other things to do than making the digital world a little more secure and human friendly. But maybe you can use this opportunity to point out some some things. Firstly, cryptography is finished and thought out. Open source is finished and thought out. They exist. Please, use them. Listen a bit when cryptographers warn against uh, specific techniques, then it's usually a good idea to not use them anymore. With uh, seven mouse clicks, you can uh, configure SSL in a way that the NSA cannot listen in anymore. That's something you can do as a user, but also as a user we can address the industry and we can say we really want you to use strong cryptography and if you look at the current developments at Apple and Google and Microsoft that increase end-to-end -end encryption it shows that putting pressure on the companies can be very effective. And to say it again with the words of Edward Snowden, crypto A works. It is not an arcane black art. It is a basic protection 
the defense against the dark arts for the digital world. We must implement it and actively research it. I'm a researcher in this area, so uh, it's, it may be a little surprising when I say this. We uh, mathematicians need some funding, but it's not so relevant. Um, it doesn't really matter if it comes a few years, a few months later or not. The, the big problem is actually applying these techniques, so please do that. The BMI has, uh, the BSI has uh, published uh, uh, tips, uh, standards for security in internet communication, but they don't stick to themselves. Uh, um, there's an IT security law about security with critical infrastructure, but there's no definition of this, and there's also no explanation why not just everybody sh uh, and every every infrastructure should be seen as this. Critical infrastructure is uh, yeah, water, electricity, but well, you could also say um, uh, gas, and yeah, so where do you um, set, uh, uh, how do you define the difference? Uh, Wir brauchen gar nicht erst anfangen, wenn wir Sicherheit nicht auf dem Stand der Technik haben wollen. Wir müssen Sicherheit haben, die vorausschaut und die guckt, was können wir wirklich tun, dass auch in zwei Jahren noch sicher ist, eben nicht TLS eins zu unterstützen, sondern andere Mechanismen zu haben. So, we can't really have security on the state of the art if we don't know what security implies. So another point is, what happens if something goes wrong? Um, is there any liability or any damages? So what the um, IT security law also includes is that if you have a security issue, then you need to report it. The problem is that this reporting is anonymous. So the company has to report it to the BSI, but normally no one will ever find out which company or which critical infrastructure were affected. So there is no public pressure um, to actually fix bad implementations of security because the law also doesn't have any sanctions. So even when I completely ignore it and fail everything, there is no legal sanctioning but instead there will be a press conference and they will say, well, the industry should just solve that amongst themselves because they know best. There's only uh, a punitive process for extreme security issues. So I asked, well, what is the definition of an extreme security issue? And they replied, well, if everybody noticed that the, the power went out, then I guess we noticed something went wrong with the power company. So what we demand is that we don't want a uh, IT security simulation law. We want the, the providers of critical infrastructure to be forced to ensure um, proper safety protocols, because otherwise there will be no public security. So another thing we want is there are zero days. So we have security holds that are not publicized, that only a small group knows about and can abuse. So that there is no chance for the software manufacturer to patch those issues. And normally what you want is that those zero-day exploits are disclosed to the manufacturers and the programmers of the software so they can make an attempt to solve it and fix the issue before it is uh, publicly disclosed. So ideally you would have the fix in the same minute or before everybody um, else finds out about the issue. 
but we have realized that zero days are being sold. They're being sold to average criminals, but they're also being sold to the BSI. So the security agency, the federal security agency buys zero days to prevent um, them, them being used, which of course doesn't work because just by buying the zero days, they, they don't get off the market, they will still be used against others. And at the same time, you feed a market, so you spoil the market for those who just want to uh, make the software better by disclosing it to the software manufacturers. And you do not want them to, to run into liability issues, which leads in to closed systems that we cannot look at leaving us behind uh, unprotected and powerless, which leads us to our next topic, namely the topic of trust. Yeah, as we said, we are in a situation where when we can look into the code, we can see problems and fix them. The question is, how long will this be possible? If we have a uh, wide deployment of Windows systems with a source code we cannot look at, then we have a problem. Now, people argue that Microsoft doesn't have backdoors because they have shared source initiatives, which means that some governments can look at the source code. However, there we have the problem that we have a situation where state actors can look at the Windows code, and that, of course, makes it easier for them to find exploits. The problem is, and that came up with the BSI, but also with the state Trojan, is that we obviously have uh, agencies that buy these exploits and use the knowledge of the shared source to develop their own attacks. So, and so far, this entire scenario leaves us behind rather uh, without defense. Which brings us to a technical point, but I will try to break it down. The problem is that with the introduction of Windows 10, a new security architecture was introduced by the people that just a few slides ago we showed um, make rather catastrophic mistakes with patches or with hotfixes. In software, it is a problem that on the modern systems, we might be unable to develop free software properly. Concretely, with more and more Windows 10 devices, it will be impossible to disable secure boot. Secure boot is practically practically a restriction to only Microsoft or Microsoft certified, uh, Microsoft allowed software, where we get to one of the points where I wonder about the response from Heiser, the German uh, IT journalist, who say that, yes, these problems exist, but for most Linux distributions, they do not pose a problem. Because, I'm sorry, but the, the current Debian version does not fit in the secure boot process. Uh, Linux Mint neither. In reality, it is so that only a handful of Linux distributions um, can, or can, can still boot with secure boot. They even say older or exotic software fails the secure boot prerequisites. Well, what is exotic software? Exotic software is what people develop and knew. It's what brought the internet to where it is today. This entire internet has been built on uh, old and exotic software. So again, the people who are a little older might remember in the beginning of the internet, there, even in my uh, talks, everybody talked about OSI protocols. And then there were some unwashed hackers that started making TCP IP over OC and the universities. So everything we, we think is cool, everything on the internet once used to be exotic software developed by people who might not have had the possibility to have the software certified by Microsoft. So when Microsoft closes Secure Boot, the development of open source software will become very difficult or maybe even impossible. This is problematic because it's very technical. Some parts in Secure Boot are really technical, but in principle, you can break it down to, if we don't put lots of pressure onto Microsoft now, 
then even more systems will be restricted to only Microsoft or Microsoft-allowed system. This does not mean the end of the world. It does not mean that we cannot use um, Linux systems like Red Hat or SUSE, which have an industry background anymore. Um, not, not only for the fact that Microsoft is one of the only Linux companies to actually make money, um, they will continue supporting that. But the esoteric and exotic software, so that which is new and so on, that which is being developed and grows, that will be um, massively um, impaired. Another point at the moment is that if we have access to the system, we can prevent some patch catastrophes. So just think about how to exploit Windows systems. It's, it's not a big secret. You sit at home. You look at the current patches in Microsoft. There's um, ready-made tools that look at the patches and then tell you where the security hole is. And then you have the time frame until all the systems are patched. Obviously, they will all be patched within minutes. So the the, an, the attack angle of attack is very small. Now, of course, it isn't because it, you know that a large part of um, the Berlin authorities are still using Windows XP, where they have certainly haven't gotten any patches more any patches in the last year because there weren't any published. Then you can imagine that's a real problem. So, if we can't do anything in the systems, if we can't tinker with the systems anymore, then it's not just a hobby with uh, people with black hoodies anymore, but it's an immediate problem for the entirety of software security. So we can say, okay, Microsoft is a private company um, under US law, which is bad enough, but also they just fuck things up for our last year. So if you stand, if you sit in front of a computer and you're trying to boot Windows, but it doesn't boot, and then you find out that they also destroyed Linux installation, well, that's just no fun. As we said, we need the sovereignty about our devices, and that's being reduced further with Windows 10. And I believe that Microsoft here violates agreements they have made with European governments and companies where they have strongly requested the possibility to disable secure boot, which means we have hardware and we can decide if we want to enter the security world of Microsoft, which the majority of people will do, but the possibility of disabling it will be drastically reduced within those 10. Last words to sum everything up. The good news is <laughs> you know that maths are holding. We don't really have to, to do much there. It's, it's great. They, uh, they, they spent billions of dollars trying to break the maths, but they, all they did was uh, put a little crack in it. The other thing is computers get faster and faster. And we say, great, we do just the kind of maths that profits from um, increasing computer performance. It, because it profits the, the, people, the person encrypting more than the attackers. If you, if you look at the maths, and maybe you might, you might not have loved maths as much as I did in school, but if you look at it, you can just trust me, math is holding, the algorithms are holding, and the constructions are sound. So, yeah, we can just say, right, you have a huge supercomputer, we just increase the key length, that is totally possible. So, please rethink your sense in mathemat mathematics. Um, mathematics is your friend. The best news is you don't actually have to apply it, because open source exists and you can just use that. So, you can uh, still dislike math as long as you use the, uh, the right software. Another final word, we already uh, mentioned it. There is software that helps us with encryption and privacy. And even if we cannot know that the software is free of security holes, that means if, if we don't know if our uh, PGP keys 
are not attacked on a hardware level, it is still the worst possible choice to not encrypt. So this sort of fatalism doesn't bring us anywhere. We have to realize that any kind of hardware attack, any kind of encryption, makes it harder to get at your data. So if we protect ourselves, that does not mean it's impossible for the NSA to get to you. But if all of us do use encryption, and all of us use reliable encryption, that raises the bar a lot, because it is, even if it's less work for the NSA every day, it still means it's, it's much more work than having unencrypted data. Also, with more users, we increase the motivation and the pressure to audit the software. So, uh, simply by saying we have this widely used software, there is a collective duty to ensure that the software we use is secure. Google went ahead with the Zero Day team uh, because they are a company that use a lot of open source software. And they said, we use so much of it, we want to make sure we can rely on it. There's a, a certain um, duty we have because we make so much money with that software and we use it so much that we should actually try to get uh, give back to the community by ensuring that we make it as secure as possible. And that is not just a task of a company like Google, who is a quasi-monopolist, but it's also a task for our uh, politicians and our authorities, which have a uh, which which must demand auditing and security instead of always asking for key escrow and similar. And of course, we have to uh, support free and open source software because only that allows us to find security issues, to develop software, um, to further research and um, actively apply new algorithms, and where everybody can um, participate. And finally, we believe there is crypto magic. And crypto magic is the combination of cryptography based on the maths that haven't really changed in the last 10, 15 years, and open source software. So we want to use good cryptography, and we want to know what our systems do, not just in software, but also in hardware. We want to know what they do, and we want to protect our data. Thank you. Vielen Dank erstmal bis hierhin. Äh, gibt es denn vielleicht Fragen? Weil wir haben noch ein paar Minuten Zeit an die beiden. Ja, da sehe ich den ersten. Moment. Ruhig bei den Fragen hinstellen, weil dann sehen Sie. Okay, are there any questions? If you have questions, just get up. Hi. Um, you mentioned lots of Microsoft products. Uh, looking around, you see a few and few laptops and more and more mobile phones and tablets. What's the situation on free software and maybe disabling locked bootloaders there? Um, uh, in the area of mobile devices, there are some open source projects, but uh, indeed we're not as far as we would like to be there. There's some interesting things. Um, uh, also, basic uh, competition laws, uh, comp competitive laws, are being used to force manufacturers to open their systems. But we're not as far as on desktops. So with Linux, we have a competitive and ap applicable solution. So in the area of mobile devices, you're right, there is still um, a long way to go. Another problem is that with mobile devices, we not only have to trust the operating system, for example, Android, but we also have to trust the baseband processor. The baseband processor is the sub-processor that handles all the rudimentary communications to the cell tower network, and we don't see anything about it, and there is a second operating system running underneath the actual operating system, which we basically cannot influence at all. Um, there are attempts to create open source baseband but as far as I know, they didn't get very far. And I think that is a problem that we direly need to address. Because I think they, they tried building the open basements before uh, smartphones became ubiquitous. 
and I think now we have reached a point where we have to look at that again and say, this is a problem that affects us all. We have to invest here. Okay. Follow-up question. Uh, I work with uh, youths, and I try to uh, get them to use BGP, but they only have their smartphones. Um, at best, I can get them to signal three ma, but I can't achieve any more. Um, so there, there needs to be something that is nice and, and usable where um, everybody is. Um, there's, there's Facebook, I like to have them with Diaspora, but I, I can't get them there. I think we already mentioned that we need people who not only work on the lower layers, but we also need people who work on the UI and UX. We have a problem with monopolies, uh, network effects, because people are joining Facebook because everybody else is at Facebook. And I think it's a, it's a long process until these alternatives can establish themselves. I can only speak about myself personally, looking back how many encrypted emails I got a few years ago, like two years ago, um, that was maybe a single per, single digit percentage. And today I, I've looked that about 40% of emails I get privately are encrypted. I might not have the same target group as uh, today's youth has, but I still think that there's a de development of people who might not be journalists who, or um, technologists still use more and more encrypted emails. And the more this is uh, publicly discussed, and the more you maybe ask your parents, hey, um, I can send you, uh, can I send you encrypted email now, um, the more pervasive this will become. You already mentioned basement processes and code running on them. But can we even trust our hardware? Because a lot of, a uh, lot goes back to the hardware. Uh, if we look at modern uh, Intel hardware, there's on-die debugging, there's uh, more and more cores, there's GPUs with extra software and firmware that we can't reason about. That which is underneath our open, soft, open source software that we use, can we trust that? Are there backdoors in there? And is there any way to find out? Uh, extensive answer, no. The problem is massive. I'm uh, used to something in this area, but when I uh, looked at the current state of affairs, these attacks on the lowest levels of the hardware, I just stand there and shake my head. Well, that's that's the matrix. They can do anything on the lowest levels of your hardware. And uh, I was shocked when I saw that UEFI has it's also it's, it's like a, a separate operating system with encrypted and signed Intel code that suggests there might be a backdoor. So it feels like I'm in, in the wrong, uh, on the wrong movie here. Uh, many years ago on Hacker Scene, we warned against backdoors in, in hardware and software. And looking back at my talks, every time I said that for political reasons I exaggerated backdoors and their impact, um, I have been uh, proven wrong by, by reality because it's even worse than I imagined it to be. And now we're dependent on some hardware manufacturer in China. And now when, when politicians say we don't want to have a back door, we want a front door, how can we argue against um, Chinese governments um, demanding back doors in their, hardware, in, in their hardware that they manufacture? So the problem is we need open source hardware, not because we are paranoid hackers, but for the industry, the industry that competes um, with companies that, that might not like the Americans or the Chinese listening and everything. So the answer is, I cannot help you. If there are devices that uh, communicate on a, a low network level, I can do anything I want in the operating system without even noticing what, what's going on in lower levels. You mentioned GNU-PG. 
on the slide. And I think the, the main problem is it's, it's much too complicated. If you look at the command line settings, there's hundreds, if not thousands. And I think there's no one in the audience here who could uh, manually encrypt an email with that. And I think that's the main problem. It's just too complicated. As long as my mother needs a 10-hour um, a 10 hour course to encrypt her first email, I think this is where the, the biggest complexity is in. But if we need more user-friendly and easy-to-use tools that work cross-platform to enable users to use encryption, because until then, this will remain a fringe topic for minorities. Um, I would contradict you here, because nobody in this day is forced to encrypt their emails on the command line. There are wizards, there are plugins for all mail clients, there's pretty much everything. And I think one of the core problems with the adaptation of encryption software is that people just don't try, because everybody says, here, this is something for the techies, for the nerds with the hoodies. And so they say, well, I can't use it anyway. And I don't know how many people I taught mail encryption in the last few months. And they were not computer scientists. They were not hackers. They didn't have a technological background, but they still managed. So I think we should just have more uh, trust in our, in our capabilities and maybe just explain it to your parents. Because what we have to get over is this this fear of technology. And it, it's uh, impossible that everybody without a computer science degree says, no, this is too complicated anyway. I'm not even going to try it. So the people also have to communicate to the developers. They have to tell them, look, we, we need this software. We want this software. We want to use it. Because um, otherwise, there will never be change. Yes, you're right. But uh, still, if, if you look at, for example, the key servers, there's many decentral key servers. They're full of spam. Um, there's no encryption for the key server lookups. Encrypting group messages with PGP is a problem that practically doesn't work. And it's all these small, small, uh, small building blocks that are missing. Well, to, to counter that, 70% of web users install ad blockers. It's no harder than that to install a Nick mail or HTTPS everywhere. If you use Java, it's just one checkbox you have to, to uh, check. So I think you're right. We computer scientists have to realize that we developed cool toys um, and, and things that are secure and mathematically sound. But then we say, ah, come on, we're not going to build an, a GUI on top of that. Um, we will actually have to do that. But I uh, asked the users to please tell us what you actually need. Because as I said, there is lots of tools already now that exist. And even encrypting a little, um, the entire society um, will profit. If only 20% of people use HTTPS, I have um, enough noise that I can uh, attack only a, f a few single few out of millions. So if you just generally encrypt without even caring much about uh, key management and OPSEC, you make it harder. If you communicate unencryptedly, the the, the uh, agencies will just listen into the exchange points and they get everything, not just the connection data and metadata, but everything, including the contents. If only 30% use HTTPS everywhere, that means they have 30% white noise that they cannot get at. And that's a good thing. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, if you want to reach us, we're here for another while, um, or you can email us. Runde. Wir haben jetzt eine Viertelstunde Pause und dann geht es hier weiter mit dem letztpolitischen Abend der digitalen Gesellschaft hier auf der Bühne. Musik